There's no reason why we cannot have that because there's still some filth and crud out there from certain members of uh, police agencies. We, under treaty, we're promised that the red coats will protect us. Tonight, Indigenous leaders calling for police oversight on the anniversary of the Stone Child Inquiry. It was a very devastating time for this community. A lot of people had to pack up and leave. We hear from a BC chief trying to balance economic prosperity and environmental protection. He knew what he was fighting for, knew what he was fighting not only for us, but fighting for Western Canada and for the freedom of trade. And a Louis Riel coin is unveiled in Winnipeg. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. Fifteen years ago, an inquiry into the death of Neil Stone Child looked at the serious concerns of police abuse in Saskatchewan and led to the firing of the last two police officers who saw him alive. In Saskatoon, on the anniversary of, Stone, of the Stone Child inquiry, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations says changes still need to be made for Indigenous people to trust the police. Priscilla Wolf has more. Fifteen years after the release of the Stone Child inquiry report, the Federation of Indigenous Sovereign Nations acknowledges that yes, the relationship between Indigenous people and the Saskatoon Police Service has improved, but more needs to be done. Neil Stonechild was found frozen to death on the outskirts of Saskatoon, November 25, 1990, shortly after he was last seen taken into police custody. Chief Bobby Cameron of the FSIN says he looks forward to working with the Saskatoon Police Service and the province to keep improving the relationship and dialogue. Uh, we're here to say that we continue to strive for that communication piece that we at the FSIN have advocated for in terms of Saskatoon Police Service, the RCMP of Saskatchewan. It's a critical component to have that constant communication about First Nation input. Saskatoon Police Service held a community engagement session recently and Chief Cameron says it's a good start and key component to getting input from First Nations. But former chief of the FSIN, Lawrence Joseph, who was in office when Neil Stonechild died, says the police need to be policed. Saskatchewan is the only province, apparently, that does not have a, a civilian or a oversight. impartial oversight, uh, and we'd like to have that. There's no reason why we cannot have that, because it's still some filth and crud out there from certain members of uh, police agencies. We, under treaty, we're promised that the red coats will protect us. Vice Chief Dutch LaRoe says yes, they have come a long way, but there's a long way to go. I think it's more important to have a civilian oversight and how that, uh, that, um, that's arrived at, uh, because as uh, the Chief said, it's the perception of the blue veil of police covering for police. And, um, you know, that perception is not only within the Indian country, but uh, when uh, in, in outside of Indian country as well. Uh, case in point, um, we've had two deaths, one in North Battleford, another one out by uh, Wadena. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Justin Trudeau spoke to reporters for the first time today since being re-elected Prime Minister. At a press conference in uh, Ottawa, Trudeau said on the topic of reconciliation, he's impatient with the pace of progress, but insists his government has been moving forward in a meaningful way. Trudeau also said there's much more to do and that he met with national Indigenous leaders this morning to discuss child welfare and other issues. I was uh, pleased to have uh, good conversations this morning with both Natan Obed and uh, Perry Belgard. Uh, we will continue to engage uh, with Indigenous leadership across the country, uh, Indigenous communities, uh, strong voices to ensure that reconciliation isn't just a word uh, that we use, but we continue the concrete actions we've taken over the past four years and do even more to make sure uh, that the partnership and respect that is so necessary as we move forward with Indigenous peoples in this country uh, is at the core of everything we do. With Trudeau's government reduced to a minority mandate, he's been left to work with other parties to move forward. But Trudeau says he will not form a coalition government. 
I intend to sit down uh, with all party leaders uh, in the coming weeks uh, to talk about their priorities. It is not in our plans at all to form any sort of formal coalition, formal or informal coalition. A poor showing from the NDP and a resurgence from the Bloc Québécois on election night means the Prime Minister now has more flexibility on which opposing parties he can lean on for support. Trudeau says he intends to sit down with all party leaders to discuss their priorities and how compromises can be made to re respond to issues across Canada. Economic prosperity and protecting the environment can be a tough balance in resource towns. And for one struggling community in British Columbia, they say the path forward is self-governance and equity partnerships. Lori Hamlin has the story. Off the Alaska Highway, in BC's far northeast corner, is Fort Nelson First Nation. They're part of Treaty 8, and their traditional territory sits on a wealth of natural gas and timber. But over the last decade, both industries have gone from boom to bust. It was a very devastating time for this community. A lot of people had to pack up and leave. Charlene Gale is the community's chief. She started working at one of the local sawmills when she was a teenager. When I moved here when I was 16, um, the, the town was booming with forestry. And I had an opportunity to work the weekend cleanup as a student. And that was really good money for somebody my age. Between 2005 and 2008, a downturn in the U.S. housing market forced the mills in the area to shut their doors, putting hundreds of workers and loggers out of jobs. But as one industry closed down, another ramped up. We were very fortunate because oil and gas was starting to pick up, the new technologies were coming, some got new training, some, you know, um, got better pay. So it really, really did bring a lot of value to our nation. Then, in 2014, gas prices also hit a downturn, and the community had nothing left to fall back on. People and businesses went bankrupt. Many had to move or find jobs hours away living in private camps. My husband's been working out of town for the last six years, and, you know, that's hard on a family. Harvey Harold was born and raised in the town of Fort Nelson. He's been working in oil and gas for 27 years. Harold says he's one of the lucky ones because he still has work in his hometown. My family has been here since 1932, so we're one of the pioneering families of this community, and it's, it's my home. I, I love it here. Harold explains that the area sits on massive amounts of natural gas that could provide Canada with heat for a hundred years. This plant is capable of uh, producing a billion cubic feet a day of gas and right now I think they're at a hundred million. So they're only at one tenth of what this plant can produce because of the falling gas prices due to the American market and their gas production going up. There is no market in North America for our gas. That's why the LNG is so critical for production in the North, is because that gives us another customer to sell our gas to. But Fort Nelson's gas is not part of the new LNG Canada project. The 670 kilometer pipeline will bring fracked gas from BC to the coast and then ship to Asia. The cost of trucking Fort Nelson's gas almost five hours south to the proposed coastal gas link pipeline is too expensive. It's kind of sad that there is so much gas here and like with the market crashing in Canada, it's actually booming in the States. So they have less regulations than us. And if you came up here and tried to do what they did down there, it, it would never be allowed. Chief Gale says striking a balance between environmental stewardship and economic prosperity is top priority for her people. The Fort Nelson First Nation has many reserves. This is the main reserve, but we have people that still live on the land. They never got pushed off by the Indian agent and they continue to practice our traditional ways. We will never, ever, ever um, give up any of that just for a few dollars. A new community forest jointly managed by Fort Nelson First Nation and the municipality announced last summer may be exactly what the area needs to bring it back to life. But to maximize the benefits, the chief wants to reopen one of the mills and buy equity in the project. People don't want to 
bring our material for it to be processed somewhere else. It needs to be processed in, in the town of Fort Nelson. Chief Gale, who is also the chair of the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, says in order for First Nations to succeed, all governments must recognize the benefits of self-governance and create effective partnerships. First Nations really want to be involved in equity positions for major projects over 100 million occurring within their territories. And if we're involved in day one, we can help make projects be successful. And I think it's important that government and industry understands this, that the way we're thinking is changing, the way we're doing business is changing, and the way we want to be involved is changing. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Fort Nelson, First Nation. Still to come, we'll speak with Kanahus Manuel about her arrest that has left her with a broken wrist. But first, here's a look at Thursday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, sunny and 16 for Halifax, 15 under sunny skies in Charlottetown. A high of 5 for Nain, 8 and showers for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Rain and 13 for Montreal, showers and 10 for Saguenay. Showers and 15 for Toronto, 13 with rain for Ottawa. A high of plus 4 for Thunder Bay, snow and plus 1 in Welcome back. Last weekend, Kanahus Emanuel was arrested in what she and her lawyer say was an excessive use of force by the RCMP. She and her brother-in-law, Aisha Jules, are members of the Tiny House Warriors. They were in northern BC protesting against work related to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Kanahus joins us now from Kamloops. Kenahus, thanks for joining us. Uh, what were you doing when your encounter with the RCMP officers happened? Um, we were living and occupying our traditional territory at Moonbeam Creek and unceded Sequatmuk Territory. We're with Tiny House Warriors and our mission is to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, on that Saturday morning of my arrest, um, we had seen some illegal work that was happening on the highway and we had told them no and it's one of our rights to give no consent to unwanted development in our territory. And what happened after that resulted in the RCMP coming to the site, slamming me down, breaking my wrist, cuffing me, shackling me, and at the end, denying me medical attention for hours, denying me um, my lawyer call for hours. Um, what happened was pretty well in custody torture can you tell us more about so what did take place when you were taken into custody? Um, on on Saturday, October 19th, myself and Tiny House Warriors are occupying our traditional territory in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This is the second reclamation of our lands uh, through Tiny House Warriors and the Sogwatmuk Women Warriors. We are taking land back and we are stopping a pipeline every right we have as Indigenous people to stand and exclusively use and occupy our lands. Um, there's many different contractors that have contracts for Trans Mountain Pipeline and they're all acting illegally without the consent. Indigenous people throughout this whole Trans Mountain line, throughout 1,152 kilometers of pipeline here in unceded BC, um, have said no, there's no consent for this Trans Mountain Pipeline to be built yet they continue to push forth with illegal construction. We are located on Highway 5 in between Blue River and Belmont, and we see daily the amounts of pipes, heavy machinery going north, stockpiling and get ready to just plow this pipeline through. And it's scary, and it's scary the amount of police presence that took place and the escort that I had, the heavy armed escort in order for me to even get any type of medical attention. There was around seven RCMP with me at the Royal Inland Hospital as my ankles were shackled um, and a wrist, a, a cast on my wrist and arm. Um, it's a it's a full cast all the way up to my, to my elbow. This is a hard cast. I, they broke my wrist. Um, right now the RCMP are denying any injury to, to myself, and, and this is the proof. I have proof of my injuries. Um, my wrist was broken, my, my arm, my back. This is a six foot five 
massive white male RCMP officer that purposely attacked me in order to injure my arm, knowing that I am a traditional tattoo artist, knowing that I'm a traditional midwife, I need my hands. We're artists on the front lines. We need our hands to continue to do our work. Kenahus, this is uh, certainly not your first arrest. So how will it affect your resisting the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Our, our intention is never to be arrested. We never we want to be held captive by a colonial oppressive police force. We know what happens at the hands of the RCMP as Indigenous people. That's not our intent. Our intent is to educate our people about Indigenous land rights, that we have every right to occupy our lands off of the Indian reserves, to assert our title, to exclusively use and occupy our territories, to say no to development, and choose our own leadership in doing so. And so what we're saying here is there needs to be change in this country of Canada. If reconciliation is real in Canada, it means land back to Indigenous people. You can't have reconciliation in Canada without recognition and implementation that we hold title to our lands. Underlying radical title is Indigenous title here in BC, all across the country of Canada. Canada, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Today on In Focus, we discussed what the federal election results mean to Indigenous issues, and we heard from newly elected 25-year-old MP for Nunavut, Mumala Kaka. We also went to Ontario, though, where a high school feud turned violent recently, resulting in an altercation between an Indigenous student and one from London's Middle Eastern community. From there, it spiraled to include others, and in the end resulted in Oneida and Chippewa of the Thames setting up checkpoints at entrances to their communities after threats had been made online to burn them down. We discussed what's being done by these communities to get people involved and move forward respectfully. For me, myself personally, the school didn't really do too much. They're actually still to this day haven't done anything at all. The provincial police, the Ontario provincial police, the London police still haven't done nothing to this day. Um, as far as I understand it, it's between a jurisdiction issue is why there was no charges laid on the actual threat in mm -hmm. the first place. And uh, I, just, I just think that there's, there's nothing being done from the school or our uh, elected council from Oneida. Nothing has been done. They downplayed the whole issue, sent all our kids back on Monday after we made a big deal. The police and the band council sent letters out and stuff like this. And then all of a sudden Monday, the kids are allowed to go back in school with nothing had took place within that time, even still to this day as we're speaking now, all they come up with is they want to meet with, uh, with their, their, their families, they want to meet with our kids' families, they want to meet with the school. Like as far as I understand, that should have been done over a month ago when this issue actually first started. And as far as the understanding, reconciliation, these individuals um, have to understand they're visitors to this land. This is our land. They are also visitors to this land. Just like anybody else under the two row wampum, they had to adhere to these issues that we have. Just to, to begin this conversation in terms of what steps we can take to, to move forward, uh, we do acknowledge that we are all treaty people and that we are all uh, living on lands um, that have been taken unjustly. Uh, and uh, this was actually uh, part of one of my sermons that I delivered um, two weeks ago uh, to indicate that we do have an obligation towards the indigenous peoples of this land mm -hmm. um, and through right. some of the uh, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report that was published in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did speak uh, to this matter publicly uh, within my community just to indicate the need to be able to understand more about some of the injustices that have taken place um, and that we, we need to take steps towards reconciliation. Coming up, Louis Riel received a rare honor for his birthday. But first, the rest of Thursday's weather forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, 10 above for high level, 7 and snow for Fort McMurray, 13 under sunny skies for Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, 60 for Calgary, 13 and sunny for Vancouver, sun's out and 12 above for Victoria. Snow and plus four for Dees Lake. Sunny and nine for Fort Nelson. Minus five for Rock River and Old Crow where snow is on the way. Plus nine under sunny skies for Fort Liard and Trout Lake.
Minus 12 with snow for Saks Harbor. Minus 7 and flurries for Fort McPherson. Welcome back. A new limited edition coin has been designed to commemorate the life of Métis leader Louis Rial. The design was unveiled on the 175th anniversary of Rial's birth in the province he helped shape. The Royal Canadian Mint revealed the coin in Manitoba on Wednesday. It's a portrait of Riel wearing his buckskin coat with fur trim and Ojibwe florals. It includes the Métis sash wrapped around the coin as an infinity symbol and shows the Machif language. Only 15,000 will be produced and they'll be available in November. Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand wants Métis history to be corrected and says the coin is a good step forward. He knew what he was fighting for, knew what he was fighting not only for us, but fighting for Western Canada and for the freedom of trade, the freedom of ability to live and, and develop ourselves as communities and as people. The land claims that was promised to him and the children that they would be protecting that for the future was robbed from us. Our lives were robbed, our future was robbed, and that resembles a, a history that has to be corrected. He's been striking chords with audiences for years, playing the fiddle and keeping Métis culture alive. He has a festival named in his honour and has dedicated much of his life to ensuring young people have the opportunity to enjoy music. CTV brings us this profile of John Arcand. Wesley Beaumont is a fixture here at the senior centre in the small town of Hanley, just 30 minutes south of Saskatoon. He's tried his hand at most volunteer jobs here and takes pride in the number of people he knows in the community. I know some, everybody here, most people, and uh, been great. At 91 years old, he's lived in this town of 511 people all his life, so there aren't too many people who don't know him either. He's here at the senior centre a lot. When he's not playing cards or shuffleboard, he can be seen setting up tables for events like Christmas parties and getting coffee ready in the morning. And why does this man of few words still do it? Well, I enjoy it. His service to the town extends into the sports community, too. He's volunteered a lot of his time at the golf course and local curling rink, remembering fondly an all-night bond spiel. A night curling, a weekend curling, and with... Uh, when they used to have a, a round the clock spiel here, they used to start on a Friday night and go right through till Sunday. He was even recognized by the town recently and after. That was not that that's was John Arcand. No, I kept waiting for him to <laughs> the, the Technical glitch, yeah, that but that no, story. that was not John Arcand. We'll uh, hopefully have that story for you tomorrow. Hopefully. That's your APTN National News for this Wednesday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. And if you missed today's In Focus, you can catch it on Core Airy tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Central. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for tuning in. And I'm Dennis Ward. Have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.